Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm your host, Joe Kent, Executive Vice President of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, filling in this week for Kelly Iakina. My guest today is Jessica Poitras. She's an attorney with the Institute for Justice, which is a public interest law firm based in Arlington, Virginia. Jessica recently co-authored an op-ed in the Honolulu Star Advertiser that put a spotlight on Hawaii's occupational licensing laws. And Jessica believes these laws need to be changed, especially as they apply to natural hair braiders and barbers. And she's here to explain why. So thanks so much for talking with me today, Jessica. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. But first, a little bit about your background. Uh, and where you work. So how did you come to work at the Institute for Justice and what does the organization do? Of course. So the Institute for Justice is a national public interest law firm that works to end government abuses and overreach. Um, so after I graduated from law school, I knew that I wanted to work in um, the nonprofit sector. I wanted to help people using my, my law degree. Um, and I've always had a passion for the beauty industry um, as a consumer and someone who um, holds, um, you know, cosmetologists and, and barbers and the entire industry in, in high regard. So um, when I had this opportunity to be able to work with the Institute for justice to break down barriers for these entrepreneurs. I, I jumped at the chance and I've been here ever since. That's wonderful um, to hear someone passionate about that work. Uh, it's a really important work. And But many of our listeners might not be familiar exactly with what is occupational licensing. So could you explain what that is? Sure. So occupational licensing is the fancy term for a government permission slip to allow people to work. Um, so most professions require um, a government paper or some sort of sign off to be able to work. So um, think of lawyers, the um, your bar license um, for cosmetologists, a cosmetology license, um, th things of that nature. So what kind of occupations does the state of Hawaii require a license for? Of course. So um, Hawaii, it has some of the most burdensome occupational licenses in the country, and it actually licenses, uh, you know, many, many different professions. So ranging from painters to cosmetologists um, and to individuals in the in the construction trade. Um, in fact, out of the 102 licenses that we studied and licensed to work, Hawaii uh, licenses 64 of them. Wow, so that's uh, among the highest. It's it's among the highest in the nation. Is that right? And one of the most burdensome. Is that right? Exactly. So Louisiana licenses the most occupations out of all of the states, but Hawaii's licenses still rank as the most burdensome in the country. Um, and that's mainly because occupational licenses require um, other things that you don't necessarily see. So the fees and the exams and things like that are the high barriers um, that that individuals who want to work have to overcome first before they're even able to to first um, start working in, in their desired profession. Oh, I see. So Hawaii's um, uh, occupational licensing requirements um, just have a lot of requirements in them. You have to work for longer than any other state and pay more fees than any other state and so on. So That's well, exactly now, what right. was the what was the justification behind that, though? Why would they pass laws like that? So, you know, it really depends. Um, and I, do, I certainly don't want to speak for, um, you know, the legislators in Hawaii, um, but, you know, the entrenched interests of certain groups really want to ensure that other people do not enter into their fields. And a great way to do that is to erect high barriers to entry. Um, so, for example, Hawaii, the um, Hawaii requires an average of 972 days for education um, and training before they before individuals can start working for for those licenses, where the national average is about 350. Um, so the justifications, um, you know, it, it's hard to square that given the fact that it's more than double what the, what the national average is. I see. So a lot of it is um, just protectionism, trying to keep the um, other competitors out of your industry. And so if the licensing requirements are higher then the barrier to entry into those jobs are harder, but 
But what about the um, supposed justification? I mean, um, they have to, they're not passing laws or justifying this on those grounds, right? So what are they saying they want the laws for? Well, it, it really depends. And again, with the, the wide breadth of, of occupations, it's hard to kind of generally figure um, or to generalize exactly what um, legislators deem um, licenses necessary for. Um, but for some of the, the licenses, health and sanitation concerns um, or um, being able to, um, you know, regulate the amount of individuals in the space, um, that, that sort of thing. I see. So when it comes to, let's take safety, for example. I mean, that's um, one you would just think of is we need licenses to keep people safe. We need occupational licenses so that um, my painter doesn't fall off the ladder or, or damage my property or something. So um, assuming that's the justification, are licenses successful in that? So, so no, not typically, right? So licenses don't necessarily make certain professions safer. And we see that, especially when you compare um, uh, some careers and fields that are more directly related to safety, like EMTs versus those that aren't like cosmetologists. Um, so uh, Hawaii actually, in fact, lowered the education and training requirement for EMTs, but maintains uh, the, the high barrier to entry for cosmetologists, including braiders, where there's very little and it's very rare um, for health and sanitation um, item or issues to occur. Um, so licensing doesn't necessarily protect safety, and there, there are definitely better alternatives to 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 fixing that issue than than licensing. I see, and and so licensing may not help, but does it hurt? Uh, have you ever come across any research that shows that um, occupational licensing actually gets in the way of health and safety and some of the goals that they want? So, you know, by keeping uh, by keeping skilled professionals out um, and requiring licenses sometimes for things that aren't direct, directly attrib attributed to those professions, um, that could certainly harm or, or create a cause for for harm for um, licensing. So think of um, a, a profession like eyelash technicians, right? Eyelash technicians have private certification that that proves their their training. Um, and, and they should have that training in order to safely provide their services. However, you know, currently in Hawaii, there's no requirement, there's no requirement or there's nothing um, that says that you need specific eyelash training. What you need is some sort of cosmetology license where they don't even teach eyelash training. Um, so aesthetics professionals can go and and buy those products and you know become eyelash techs without that specialized training. Um, and that could, you know, create some sort of um mm -hmm. potential health and sanitation risk. I see. Well, um, and a lot of it just doesn't make sense. I mean, you you uh, recently co-authored a column in the Honolulu Star Advertiser, and in it you argued that the state should, quote, repeal all barbering and cosmetology licensing. Um, now, could you explain that? Sure. So um, Hawaii's state auditor has studied the beauty industry five times since 1980, and each time the license they found the licenses for our cosmetologists and barbers are unnecessary um and so you know i think that is a very clear example of the fact that you know the the state auditor has found that these licenses aren't required they aren't necessary but legislators haven't moved and, and taken that recommendation to to try to reform the system to allow individuals to be able to work i see and and what would repealing um, those licenses do? How, right. how would that so, help? Of course. So by repealing those licenses, especially for niche beauty uh, service providers, that would allow people to enter into the field without having to undergo state mandated training requirements. Um, so right now, um, cosmetologists, niche beauty service providers, things like that, they're required to go to certain um, uh, cosmetology training programs uh, where many of them 
um, accrue student debt um, and spend lots and lots of time unrelated to the actual profession that they want to be able to work in. And so again, there are, there are alternatives um, to regulating this space. Uh, a cosmetology license doesn't necessarily fit. What would fit perhaps would be facility inspections, right? Um, so if if the goal is to you know really ensure health and sanitation and to to make sure that uh, the public safe that way, facility inspections are, are the best way to to regulate the industry and make sure that there aren't bad actors. I see. Well, when we were um, talking about this issue with our audience, we we have a newsletter um, on the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii website and. Um, thousands of people read our stuff and we were pointing to your article and talking about this and we got a lot of comments one person wrote i have a friend that this restriction harms she said why do our legislators spend more time trying to suppress local small business than support it um someone on tiktok um which if you go to oahu joe on tiktok you'll see some licensing content there and she said i was literally just talking about transferring my cosmetology license and it's a hassle too and so um, a lot of this affects a lot of people on the ground here in hawaii what would you say to those people uh well what i would say to those people is one get in contact with us let us help uh you to work on to work on bills and legislation to remove those licenses that are burdensome um you know, sometimes I think that legislators just aren't aware of, of the issues um, that come with licensing. And so making sure that your voices are heard, um, especially um, with licenses that have that are that don't exist in other states, um, having that that evidence there, um, that's the best way to to start breaking down those barriers. Um, and there's there's a lot of good reasoning and support um, behind that. So good. Well, um Another of our readers uh, said that she disagreed with us. She said licensing is a tool to protect the public. So what would you say to her? And um, and also, you know, for the sake of argument, how would you respond to someone who says that cosmetology licenses in particular help protect people from untrained beauticians? Right. So first and foremost, um, with cosmetologists in the cosmetology industry and and generally for small businesses and, and entrepreneurs uh you know we say unlicensed doesn't mean untrained right these individuals are trained they're skilled especially if they're working in the space especially if they're starting their own businesses those and that's those are the people that these bills are working to support um and you know i think we would have to have an honest conversation as to what licenses you're talking about, um, especially in, in the beauty industry for these niche beauty services like hair braiding or makeup artistry. There is very little little evidence and it's exceedingly rare that individuals um, uh, cause health and sanitation problems. What we actually find, in fact, is that most of the enforcement actions um, that happen to these niche beauty service providers, so think hair braiders, think eyebrow threaders, um, actually comes from them not having a license, not actually harming anyone. Um, and so I think that's indicative of the fact that, um, you know, uh, people want to ensure that people have a license, um, but it's not actually making anyone safer because these individuals aren't, aren't harming anyone. Okay, but what, how, would, how would you deal with market quality? Okay, so now we repeal all of these uh, occupational licenses for beauticians and cosmetologists, and, and all of a sudden the quality drops on the market. You, you uh, might not be really happy with... Um, the service that you get. So, so how would you deal with that argument? Right. So first and foremost, the uh, research shows that um, removing licenses doesn't actually lower, um, um, uh, doesn't actually lower qual the quality of service in the market space. In fact, it usually raises the um the the quality um just because there are more service providers and people um have a have a wider breadth of, of individuals uh, to choose from especially in in the beauty industry um and so you know i i think it really comes down to exactly um you know what you know what skill are you looking for what are you trying to get at um and and also um the 
the market doesn't necessarily, uh, the way that individuals choose providers doesn't necessarily change whether or not there's a license there, um, there's a license that exists. Um, even now for regulated licensed occupations, individuals choose to find their, uh, their providers through word of mouth, reputation, online um, reviews like Yelp and Google, that's where the market, that's where consumers go to look for qualified individuals. Very few people are, are checking to see if their painters have, have a license. That's true. Um, we look to Yelp, not the government, a lot of times when we're trying to find the best place for service. But um, I want to talk about your um, new report at the Institute for Justice, License to Work, and this is version three of this. We've been following this uh, for many years. Uh, it's been really helpful, but this third version looks at reforms also that states have been putting in. Um, some states have been increasing licensing requirements. Other states have been getting rid of them. But uh, on net, are we going for more licensing or less, <laughs> fewer? Of course. So um, as you mentioned, this is our third edition of License to Work, um, and it's an updated snapshot of licensing licensing's extent and burden by cataloging state licensing requirements for, again, 102 uh, lower income occupations across all 50 states. And this edition also includes uh, Puerto Rico and a compare states feature. So if you're interested, you can go to the website and compare Hawaii versus any of the 50 states in, in Puerto Rico, which is really, um, really interesting. But to answer your, your second question, you know, on the whole, we've seen about a 20% decrease in licensing across the, across the country overall. Um, and I think that's because, you know, men, um, both political administrations, so um, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and the, the, and the Biden administration has called for um, states to really take a look at, at occupational licensing and has really highlighted it as a barrier for workers across the country. So uh, for the most part, we've seen um, a, a decrease, but that doesn't mean that there isn't work to do because there certainly is. I see. Would you say that this issue cuts across partisan lines or um, is it is it a partisan? It's kind of a local issue, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it's a, it's a state by state issue and it really shouldn't be partisan. Um, and we find that, it, it, you know, it, it often isn't um, because there there are uh, interest for 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 everyone, right? Um, I think all states and including Hawaii are interested in bringing people to their state, making their state open to work, um, creating opportunities for current citizens, and that's what occupational licensing does. Um, I, I always like to add um, and specifically highlight some of the states that have um, enacted great uh, cosmetology licensing reforms, um, like. Minnesota in 2020, when they removed the uh, requirement for makeup artists and hairstylists um, to have a full cosmetology license, there was literally a thousand new um, in individuals who were who were able to register with the with the state to be able to start working in that space. Um, also in Arkansas, when it passed its shampooer and blow dry bar extension. Uh, 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 exemption, uh, my apologies, Bill, um, the first blow dry bar in the state opened up. Um, so that is concrete proof that when you remove these barriers, individuals see the opportunity, they come and they want to build and, and they want to work. So um, hmm. now, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say, I don't know what a blow dry bar <laughs> is. <laughs> that, that is okay. So uh, a blow dry bar is essentially um, a, a place where individuals can go get their hair washed, uh, shampoo, dried, and have their hair arranged. So there's no cu cutting, there's no coloring, there's no dyes, there's no um, chemical processes happening, and it's just this booming industry. Um, but most states require the individuals who just want to provide those services to have a full cosmetology license, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and so by removing that barrier, it allows you know, these businesses to open up. Um, it supports industries like, you know, the wedding industry that whole, wholeheartedly relies on um, independent makeup artists and hairstylists, as well as the entertainment industry. So it's really, you know, a win-win for everyone. I'm hey, um, going back to that Hawaii auditor study you mentioned about um, one study earlier this year recommended against man uh, mandating license for community health workers. Um, so in prior studies, this the auditor usually recommend against licensing 
in, like in Hawaii in in Hawaii's um, state auditor reports, do we usually recommend against licensing? So I'm I'm not terribly familiar with um, most of Hawaii's state auditor uh, state auditors reports when it comes to occupational licensing, but um, I I will you know add if 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 they've done the research if they've reviewed the licenses and they've actually taken a look at the needs and that's the outcome that they've come to I think legislators should should listen and should um, react to the to those findings. Now, other than completely abolishing mandatory licensings, what kind of reforms would you suggest to improve it? Of course. So first and foremost, exemptions for um, niche uh, and safe uh, occupations should be first, right? So in the cosmetology space, um, again, we are huge proponents of um, niche beauty exemptions. Um, so niche beauty services are services that are safe because they, do, they don't use um, dangerous chemicals or, or dyes, and they don't use dangerous um, mechanical devices either. So um, you're, we're talking about eyebrow threading, makeup artistry, hair braiding, blow dry styling, that sort of thing. Um, all of those sorts of services should be exempted from state licensure um, because there's very little evidence and it's exceedingly rare, again, um, that there is any um, justification for for those licenses because individuals can provide them safely um, and they're not typically taught in cosmetology programs. But if you know there is a demonstrated need um, for for um, uh, government regulation, uh, there's there's a whole slew of of alternatives uh, for regulating these spaces. So again, um, inspections that is um, that that's the next kind of step, right? So ensuring that the government has the ability to inspect facilities for health and sanitation um, concerns, um, or things like mandated um, uh, insurance uh, for liability purposes for. Uh, um, bonds and insurance for for uh, fields where that makes sense, right? And so, you know, there are many alternatives, and licensing shouldn't be the first stop. It should it should really be the last. And can you talk about professional certification? How is that different than mandatory licensing? Of course. So, um, private certification and prof professional certification are are choices that an individual can make for um, their education. We are huge proponents of private certification. Um, it, it's a it's a great way to learn your craft and to and to um, be able to get your foot in the door. Um, the difference between a license and private certification is a license is is mandated um, to to be able to work, and it doesn't and the education requirement doesn't necessarily go towards exactly what um, your, you know, the, the service or the field that you're, you're trying to, to offer. Um, so private certification is something that you get to choose. You get to choose where it's done. And, um, you know, I liken it to kind of like a college degree, right? Um, that, is, that is where you should hold your value. So um, I hold my value in, in my law degree. I think, you know, cosmetologists or um, chefs, for instance, that's another um, great um, example holding value in in that education that private certification um, is, is is what we advocate for. I see. Um, now another comment that uh, came in when we were talking about your work is um, someone said, "What about physicians licensed to practice in other states not having reciprocity here in Hawaii, a, a barrier and a cause of fewer specialists?" So, what would you say to um, to that issue, the sh Hawaii has a severe shortage of healthcare professionals, um, and maybe some of the professionals on the mainland could practice here, except uh, occupational licensing gets in the way. So um, how would you make that easier? Of course. So I think recognition is the best way to do that, right? Um, allowing um, legislators allowing Hawaii to recognize the, the training and the licenses of uh, healthcare professionals in other states um, when they when they move into Hawaii would be the best. Now, now how would you, um, what's the difference, you said recognition and I've heard reciprocity, but what are those two, what's the difference between those two terms? Sure, of course. So um, recognition is something that Hawaii can do on its own. Hawaii can um, recognize a license, it can evaluate the license and accept the license on its own. Um, reciprocity or state compacts require, would require Hawaii um, to enter into agreements with other states um, and to um, and to create a um, 
uh, quite frankly, like a compact um, across states in order uh, that individuals would have to meet in order to be able to freely move within those states. So, oh, I see. Exactly. So recognition mm -hmm. um, retains Hawaii's autonomy um, in, in this uh, occupational licensing. Um, I see. So for, for recognition, we wouldn't need to uh, the, the cumbersome step of trying to agree on a complicated compact with a collection of other states. We could just recognize um, the uh, licenses in other states and recognize them as professionals in their fields and um, able to work here. Is that right? Exactly. And it's something that legislators could immediately do to um, to ameliorate and to fix uh, uh, worker shortage problems. Right. Compacts take a lot longer of a time um, and a lot more negotiations with different uh, state governments. Um, and, and so you wouldn't see the effects of it as quickly as as uh, recognition. Oh, when you look across the nation at this issue, especially those places that um, have had successes when it comes to uh, reducing occupational licensing requirements. Um, what are some of the stories you've seen? So and, uh, we'll and we only have one minute left here, by the way. <laughs> of course. So I will we'll end on a happy note. Um, most of the results that we've seen have been success stories, right? So again, um, when you lower these barriers, jobs and opportunities um, you know, become available and, and are abound and people can immediately um, take take those um, take those opportunities. So um, it's it's a great way for states to really address um, worker shortage issues and um, workforce issues. That's great. Well, um, hopefully uh, we can adopt some of those things that have worked here and uh, help our economy and help folks find a job. So thanks so much, Jessica Poitras, for joining us today. Jessica, again, is the attorney with the Institute for Justice. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much. Aloha. And thanks so much to you, our viewers, for watching another episode of Hawaii Together. Um, until next time, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.